Peter Duran Hits, bringing big ideas, critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And we are at our Durian Heat where we discuss matters concerning Southeast Asia. And today we are talking about Malaysia uh, regarding on Anwar's uh, verdict yesterday where he was found guilty. And uh, today's topic, Anwar's verdict, guilty or broken justice, we have Fami Fazil. He's the communication director of PKR, Pakatan, uh, sorry, Keadilan. Uh, hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Hello, good morning. Morning. How are you today? Okay, tired, but uh, still fighting. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for joining us uh, for the interview, although it's a bit early in the morning. No worries. So, uh, Fami, maybe a little introduction uh, to yourself first for our listeners. Uh, uh, what do you do, who you are uh, exactly? Yeah, uh, my name is Fami Fadzil. I'm the... Uh, I'm the Parti Katlan Rakyat's uh, Communications Director, as well as its Vice Youth Chief. Mm-hmm. So what happened yesterday, if you can describe to us? Yeah, I was in court yesterday from about 8 o'clock until, uh, all the way until about 2.30 when uh, Anwar Ibrahim was led out uh, to go to prison. So in at the start of the day, uh when when we got to court when i got to court i i felt that um, you know things things looked looked normal there were no you know extensive major roadblocks uh but when the judges uh, when the judge the chief justice started uh reading his judgment about when when court uh came into session about 10 then i started to you know you start to get the feeling because what it was was um initially he would read all of the um, submissions from the defense and the and the prosecution and he would follow up with uh, what the court found the, the court findings and and it came as a shock to a lot of the legal practitioners to the, to the lawyers as well as uh, to the public that none of the um, arguments or submissions of the defense uh, were were accepted so everything from um, the the carpet being in a separate room mm-hmm. from the alleged incident uh, where the alleged incident took place to um, there was a suit that uh, the the uh, defendant uh, sorry the, the the prosecution witness one or Saiful mm-hmm. uh, was alleged to have received uh, yet uh, it had no label but the court found that um, PW one was not given the opportunity to explain. Uh, yet, the lawyers were telling me that it was the prosecution, uh, uh, prosecution's lead counsel, uh, Dr. Sri Shafi'i, who mentioned it during uh, during the 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 start of uh, hearing that it was a Brioni suit. So it it it's it's quite it's quite uh, uh, it's it's quite disappointing for for those of us who are in the public gallery. Mm-hmm. But there were. There were two moments I think particularly striking. The first one was as um, I think the judge was reading about halfway through, when suddenly the uh, the public announcement system, the PA system, um, started to crackle. Oh. First, it, first it was a very soft crackle, and he kept going, and then it gradually grew louder and louder and louder till it drowned him out, and and it was quite surreal. Uh, some, you know, I would take it as a sign of providence. So, <laughs> so, so he co- was completely drowned out, and he had to stop, and then mm-hmm. they had to shut shut off the system. And the second one was after um, the court uh, rejected that Sri Anwar's uh, appeal and uh, reaffirmed the conviction, and the, uh, sentencing had hadn't been done yet. And after mitigation um, by both uh, prosecution and defence. Uh, Dr. Sri Anwar was uh, going to address the court and he <coughs> started and then as he was as he was uh, reading out his statement to, to the court you know he, he started uh, saying uh, the judges had an opportunity to to be on the right side of history and to correct a lot of a lot of things and and not remain you know not not to choose to remain on the dark side uh, and his statement is now, you know, it's it's everywhere. Uh, but as he was reading that, 
the Chief Justice, he started uh, to get very, um, very hot under the collar. And, and then he said, you know, no, 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 stop, stop, no, no, oh. no. And he kept saying that. And then he said, don't condemn the court. But uh, the Anwar kept kept on going, so Anwar kept on going, and the judges all suddenly stood up and left. Mm. And this was this was a sight for a lot of us because we've never seen judges walk out from from proceedings. So, Is this <coughs> something unique? I mean, in the history of Malaysia or even the world, for something uh, such a high profile case uh, happening in such a manner? Yes, yes, definitely. I think. Uh, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of governments around the world uh, have already released statements. You know, uh, Australian government, the U.S. embassy in Kuala Lumpur. In fact, the White House National Security Council advisor uh, has released a statement, and there's already a petition up on you know on on the White House uh, to petition uh, President Obama to to make uh, releasing Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, key policy uh, in its relations towards Malaysia. Mm-hmm. So so I think it's being taken very, very seriously by governments around the world and by uh, human rights organizations because, um, you know, whether we like it or not, Anwar Ibrahim has become a prisoner of conscience. Mm-hmm. And, and when you talk to any legal expert, any lawyer, yeah, who, who when they hear the arguments uh, presented by the defense during the course of uh, the trial, um, they will say no. Look, look, Shafi. Uh, you know the, the the It's it's a very strong case for 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 Anwar. Yet it turned out this way. So and it, there was no dissenting judgment. It was five zero. <clears throat> so so this is this is a very very uh, very interesting scenario. This is a very interesting case, uh, and it is very unique because mm-hmm. also Anwar Ibrahim is the leader of the opposition of the current leader of the opposition. So you have, you know, someone who is in a very important position um, removed just like that. Mm-hmm. Of course, not just like that. I mean, it took <laughs> seven years, but but it's removed. Yeah. But, but from your own point of view, uh, and also the view of those within the opposition party, uh, do they do they agree? Um, with uh, the verdict itself that Anwar is indeed guilty? So the party, uh, we had a meeting last night and there was a press conference and uh, the party's president, uh, that, that's we, Dr. Wan Aziza, came out with a statement and uh, we condemn, the party condemns uh, the judgment and it is, uh, uh, it is a politically motivated uh, act, this whole case, yeah, we, we stand by that position that it's a politically motivated act to uh, stem the tide uh, of change that's supposed to, to to happen in Malaysia. And because it is a threat to the hegemony of uh, the ruling parties, so therefore it had to be neutralized, you know, and, and that's why we, we still feel that it's a politically motivated case altogether. Mm. On Saiful's side, did he say anything? Did did he yeah, yeah. Uh, express any of his feelings? Yes. Um, uh, a night before, uh, a night before, uh, sorry, sorry, last night uh, on TV1, yeah, which is the main news channel for, for the government, uh, they add, uh, you know, quite a lengthy uh, phone interview with uh, Saiful. So that was quite peculiar as well because it's supposed to be a you know uh, why is why is the government basically carrying the side of the story so prominently and and uh, of course we know now that the prime minister's office released a statement almost immediately as the the sentencing took place so how how does the prime minister's office know immediately that you know and was fully prepared statement so if the government doesn't have a hand in it, how did these things, you know, happen so um, serendipitously? I think that's one way of putting it. Mm-hmm. We will take one short break. Uh, after that, we will return with uh, Fami Fazil to talk about Anwar's verdict. The Duran Hits, bringing big ideas, critical opinions in Southeast Asia.
Hey, this is Arlene. Hello, this is Gauri. We are still back with Fami Fazil, Communication Director of Parti Keadilan. So, Fami. Yes, Arlene. Yes. <laughs> uh, my question is about the judges. Uh, you mentioned earlier that they left just out of a sudden. Um, well, I know I was still speaking. Why they left? Uh, in your own opinion. Uh, I think I think why they left. We probably have to ask them sometime in the future, or when they write their memoirs, for example. <laughs> But my feeling is that as they had already uh, reaffirmed the Court of Appeals' decision to convict Anwar Ibrahim and dismiss his appeal, they should have, at the very least, uh, have heard him out, mm -hmm. uh, because they were, you know, whatever he had to say didn't would have no. Material bearing on uh, the the sentence, or, or, or you know, on 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 at least uh, he wouldn't he they would they wouldn't be have been dissuaded from convicting him. But is this uh, normal even? Yes, yes, it is. It is normal. I mean, sorry for for the <laughs> for the judges to leave. Just no, like... no, it's 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 abnormal. It's uh, absolutely abnormal. So, uh, so. It's it's quite a peculiar. Um, I think uh, we don't know what the motivations are, but people who are watching it might ask, you know, why as you know, why why did they not just let him speak and and finish his his uh, his uh, address to the court? Uh, was it was it so painful? Could they not have you know just have cited him for contempt of court? Uh, yet they they chose to to stand up and and leave. So I think for some people, they w they might say that you know it, we don't know what the motivations are, but some people might say perhaps they were pricked, their conscience was pricked by what uh, Anwar had to say, and the text of course is is disseminated everywhere. You can find it on Facebook. People are sharing it. Mm -hmm. You can find it in the news. And make and, your own decision out of what. And you, you can make your own decision, mm -hmm. you know. And and if if you were a, a, a judge. How would you respond to this? If you are someone who has who has been following the the uh, not only the last seven years of this case, but you know having seen the the um, how our the performance of our uh, judiciary, judiciary, yeah, yeah, and and you you heard what you know, or read what uh, Anwar had to say, mm -hmm. how would you feel? So I think it's open, it's open, and and uh, it's it's something which probably should be should be asked, should be debated, should be you know talked about. So Anwar has been, uh, you know, in and out of court for so long, um, and and this is not the first time where people are uh, are actually questioning uh, the judiciary system uh, on the Anwar case. But if you can just sum up your thoughts on throughout the years how Anwar has faced in terms of his legal battle on his own um, on on the issue itself, um, what is his side of the story? I think. Uh, it is a, a, a very unique position because uh, Anwar Ibrahim is to to you know to to use uh, to to use the phrase you know he he is public enemy number one to who the ruling administration mm -hmm. and and so when you look at certain circumstances uh, for example when when the court of appeal um, heard this case. They heard it in a re in record speed, you know, at record speed, and judgment was passed immediately, and sentencing was immediately on the very same day. Whereas normally you would give time for mitigation and you know to 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 get court, um, health records, but uh, I was there in court when the court of appeal sentenced uh, Anwar to um, five years uh, imprisonment in um, March of last year, and. It's very, very abnormal for, uh, you know, it's it's not normal to have a court case and uh, sentencing, mitigation and sentencing all within the same afternoon after four o'clock. It it ended about six, you know, so that was. Uh, it, it seems like Anwar Ibrahim is a very, very unique individual in in how systems uh, respond to him. And I think this is this is one of the challenge for people who are trying to bring change. People will resist change, and they will do everything to to resist change because mm -hmm. they fear what change might bring. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it is for the betterment of democracy and and for the rule of law, um, 
to all you know all peoples and and to society in general. Mm. But what what's so fearful about Anwar when you see we mentioned that he's public enemy number one because um, are they I mean if are are you are you referring that there's a conspiracy to weaken the opposition leadership? Or yes, are, I believe so. Or do you think I that the opposition so. leadership is stronger than ever? Um, I think when when uh, uh, for example that's why that's why whenever we refer to the case we refer it we refer to it in in Malay as fitnah one which was the first one first case and fitnah two because uh, throughout the whole uh, throughout the whole course of the two cases uh, 99 and 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 2008 when it started this this particular case. Uh, Anwar has maintained his innocence, and he has claimed that it is a political conspiracy uh, to to really uh, engineer the his his uh, removal uh, from the political scene. Mm-hmm. So so uh, so I think what it means is um, yes, we we see what is happening to Anwar Ibrahim and among the leaders of not just within Kadilan but also Pakatan Raya. Uh, this imprisonment reignites that that uh, the fire uh, to to continue to work hard and work together to bring about this change mm-hmm. and and i think um, it's not going to stop us because you know one of one of anwar's um, what he said in court i think is particularly striking when he said um, you know i will uh, allah is my witness i will not be silent i will never surrender and of course by that time the judges had already left but but uh, for those of us who saw it you know it 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 is a very strong battle cry and and i think um facing the different systems that we have currently in malaysia it is this kind of a battle you know and and we have to rally around this imprisonment and remember that what we are doing is to make malaysia a better place and i'm curious about the uh court's decision because back in 2012 when Anwar was acquitted uh, they came to a consensus that the DNA evidence was actually compromised so how is it that they can uh, come up two years later and say that oh no the, the the evidence was actually solid we made a mistake saying it was compromised uh, there were a couple of um, uh, issues mm-hmm. or key points that were brought forward by the defense the first one was that Saiful, uh, the question of Saiful's credibility, mm-hmm. because allegedly he was uh, he was allegedly sodomized. Yet several days later, he attended uh, a very private gathering mm-hmm. uh, with Anwar and with then mm-hmm. police. The question that um, Saiful is a credible witness, and that uh, that that's one one major major. You know, startling uh, finding, uh, and with regards to the evidence, um, the the judges, the court found that yes, again, there was no there was no major problem with with uh, you know, and 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 all of the arguments by the defense was uh, basically rejected. So so, despite the the DNA sample, for example, uh, Ram Karpal argued about the the pristineness of the quality of that uh, DNA finding if it's supposed to have degraded over time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the court found that um, degradation or the, doesn't impact the, the quality of that signal of that DNA. So, so that, for a lot of people, is, is startling. Or issues of... I think, I think um, jurists and students of jurisprudence and and uh, legal experts will be poring over the judgment because mm-hmm. there's certain uh, i remember reading tweets by you know prominent lawyers and 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 uh, legal uh, entities and they were saying that certain issues about corroboration of evidence for example uh, that that um, there was a question of if if Anwar Ibrahim had been in a lockup and he had, and allegedly uh, used certain items and then those items were used but no one saw him using those items did he really use those items so the judges said that uh, no it, it's not it's you know it, it, it was high likelihood that he used it yet no one saw him using these items mm-hmm. and and that is that in itself is a big um, a major finding and 
I think several legal experts have said that this case set certain precedents uh, for future cases, and mm-hmm. and and so it's it's people are still digesting the judgment. It's available online, so if you want, it's mm-hmm. about fifty four pages. Uh, Fami Fazil, <laughs> I I. Regarding on our judiciary system, of course, it has never been as clean as what people hope it to be. Uh, in since the uh, in the past, there were people, you know, questioning the judiciary system in this country. But has it gone worse because of this uh, judgment? I think, yeah, the party the party's position is that this uh, has smashed people's um, uh, perception in the independence of the judiciary. Uh, this case, yeah. Uh, so I think, I think uh, again at the end of the day, as a parliamentary democracy, we will see how people feel um, in at the next general election. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some of the uh, opinions from the international observers when they speak to you about their op- uh, opinions on this there was, particular case? Yeah. There was one, I, I won't name names, but there was one uh, uh, international observer who was seated right next to me in court. And the person said, uh, when the judges you know, stood up and left, they said, this person said that well, this is not a kangaroo court, this is a kindergarten court. <laughs> so I was quite shocked to hear uh, an international observer say this. But most of the international observers who've come to, uh, whether they are from uh, Law Asia or from IPU or from... Um, there, there are a number, and they've released statements, and and most of them find uh, that what has happened is 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 very very unfortunate, mm. and it's a it's a blow to human rights in Malaysia. And and do you think that uh, for them when they look at us, uh, it's going to look as if we have taken uh, a step or many steps back uh, in terms of human rights? Definitely, definitely, and it's without a doubt. Um, and and I think this is especially shameful because Malaysia is chairing ASEAN mm-hmm. and Malaysia sits on the the United Nations Security Council and yet Malaysia can do this to its opposition leader whereas in other countries the opposite opposition leader is fettered is is you know is 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 equal to the prime minister mm-hmm. But how all this would actually affect Malaysia's position in the international eyes? Uh, because I don't, I don't think Putrajaya cares. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Putrajaya cares. I mean, I mean, let's let's take let's take uh, uh, on Monday. Um, uh, New York Times released, I think mm-hmm. it was a uh, twenty thousand word article um, on you know detailing uh, how. Um, this uh, this character Joe Lowe has been buying 30 million, 40 million properties in New York and Beverly Hills, selling them to Najib's uh, stepson. And people ask, you know, okay, where's the money coming from? What is happening with the MDB? Yet Putrajaya is, you know, will just maintain uh, uh, um, this 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 uh, position of uh, no, no, everything's okay, everything's okay. Mm-hmm. The, it, it seems like Putrajaya doesn't care what people think. Yeah. And, sorry, Gami. Uh, also, the uh, IGP actually came up uh, almost immediately after the verdict to say that I don't want anyone protesting against this. The court's decision is final. And uh, was it right for him to to actually say that to come up and and scare scare away people, saying that I, I don't want to hear a single word, a single noise from any one of you? Yeah, I think I think it's very, it's it's uh, uh, very very unfortunate that the the, the top police uh, mm. officer, yeah, the police chief, uh, no one less than the the the, the IGP, um, is coming out to say something like this. You know, you're you're supposed to. Um, it's 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 very it's it's very sad for me. You know, mm. uh, uh, and and. You know, yesterday I tweeted that words, words fail me, and I think mm-hmm. certain things that that's still happening. I still feel that words fail me. I I I don't know how to respond. But uh, yesterday we sat down with with our lawyers, and uh, and and we we felt that it's very arbitrary when you look at the, you know, when when the IGP uh, tweeted uh, how mm-hmm. he wanted the the police to investigate three people, Rafizi Ramli, um, I think it was uh, Nga Koming, uh, and. And Zuna, Zuna was immediately picked up, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, and so you know it it feels very very arbitrary because 
you know, Zuna mentioned no one. Yet it's it's become a threat. You know, free speech. That. It, what what is happening to to freedom of speech in Malaysia? Mm-hmm. We will discuss more on the fate of freedom of expression in this country later on after this break. The Duran Kids, bringing big ideas, critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. Hello, this is Grace. And we are again with Fami Fazli, Communication Director of PKR, Parti Keadilan. Still on the line? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> so, uh, Fami, uh, in light of the verdict that uh, came out yesterday, I'm sure a lot of people, uh, uh, although they have already been skeptical, they are going to have even uh, further doubts about the judiciary system in Malaysia. So, uh, how uh, has this this whole thing uh, affected the judiciary system? Is it really as independent as it's supposed to be, or what is it that we need to know about it? I think, uh, uh, well, at least at least in terms of uh, uh, the party's position mm-hmm. on this matter, we feel that uh, definitely the verdict handed down to Anwar Ibrahim yesterday. Um, is a, a very clear uh, sign that people's um, perception towards the, the the judiciary, the judiciary's independence, has been smashed, mm-hmm. um, and so people don't see the judiciary as acting independently. Um, and and I think some of the lawyers commented that um, you know the set of judges that we saw yesterday were far different, completely different from the judges that were there uh, in terms of their attitude, in terms of how they were responding to questions mm-hmm. during the, the trial in uh, in uh, November, uh, October, November, so of, of last year. And and so I think uh, it's it's very, very unfortunate uh, and, and abysmal that, that uh, it's, it's come to this. Does, does, sorry, does this mean that uh we have lost the. They have lost the credibility, uh, and it's hard for people to, to uh, believe in them anymore. I think this is a question that we should put to the vote. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and, and I think. And will be like uh, another five years. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Don't be so. Uh, because it was 2013, and it's already 2015. So we're almost actually halfway mm-hmm. through this session. So the the latest is 2018, but um, in fact, signals are pointing to probably an earlier earlier uh, earlier general election so as as early as you know uh, one and a half two years from now uh, I would love to ask you uh, in the regarding of the freedom of expression in this country because this is not something new that has happened in Malaysia I mean after the sedition act that has happened like a few times before and that this is one of the major event that we are facing right now but in terms of a uh, freedom of uh, freedom of expression also uh, from uh, Anwar's side how is it gonna be done in Malaysia uh, especially for from the younger generations if if you are very vocal mm-hmm. uh, if you are extremely critical not only of the ruling regime uh, but also of anything uh, you probably have to have to run away like uh, Elvin Wong or yeah. uh, Ali Ali Ali. Yeah. yes so you know there, there are a lot of Malaysians who have decided to leave the country uh, because they just can't you know there's of course better jobs out out there for them, and um, probably they feel that the the environment in in Malaysia is is not to their liking. Mm-hmm. And no matter what program the government runs, like Talent Corp or whatever it is, it's not going to bring people back because people will not be able to say what they want to say. These mm-hmm. people, you know, and and so are you saying? Of, I mean, are you are you making the claim that uh, the the main uh, one of the main reasons for brain drain is because of the political situation in this country where freedom of expression is at risk? It's one of the mm-hmm. it's one of the factors, mm-hmm. but I think economic uh, factors also weigh in. For example, if you are a computer programmer, and you know between a job in in Silicon Valley and a, and a job in 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 uh, you know in in Selayang, uh, so I think that's that's a very big, you know, there's a reality check there as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. So I think economics economics does play a major factor as well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but for for some people, you know, being out of the country uh, means that they can also s- speak their mind, uh, especially depending, you know, where where they end up being. Um, so I think people again, you know, some people will vote at the ballot box. Some people will vote by by leaving, um, you know. I, and I know personally, I have friends who recently I was shocked to find out that my some of my high school friends have traded in their passports, you know, for for British citizenship, for Australian citizenship, and and they've already voted. You know, they, that's, that's that that in itself is a sign. It's a vote of no confidence for me. Mm-hmm. to how the government has been running the country. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about freedom expression again, do you think that under Najib administration, it will be even worse, as in like, uh, it will probably, we probably might go back to the era of operasi lalang, where everyone just have to stay silent and not, you know, voice out their mind, even in Twitter? I think, they are trying to the Najib administration is trying to create a, a climate of uh, fear and repression um where all but using we're using anything you know everything but uh, those you know exact words um the climate of fear and and, and repression because the arrests under uh, and and charging people under the sedition act for example a lot of it is politically motivated Mm-hmm. And and while we may not have the same kind of uh, detention without trial laws like the ISA anymore, uh, yet you know sometimes putting people through the court process, which is very lengthy and and you know saps your energy and your and your purse, um, is 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 as as painful. So I think um, definitely there is uh, where we stand right now because. The Najib administration has pursued um, uh, arresting people and charging people under the Sedition Act. Um, definitely, it is a major blow for not just freedom of expression but human rights in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think uh, the saddest thing is that it feels like you know Najib doesn't care <laughs> <laughs> that that the perception of his administration is is like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he can he can go around and still say you know that to the world that he's a moderate muslim but there's nothing moderate about sending your opposition leader you know the the uh, the the of the of the uh, of parliament to prison like this you know but, but do you think it will create a reverse effect um meaning that the more you detain and imprison for example Anwar Ibrahim the leader opposition leader uh, the leader of opposition coalition um it would actually uh strengthen the opposition side rather than yes. strengthen the government side Yes, yes, um, I think so, and and that's why I say, um, at least based on on our analysis, you know, uh, Anwar said that if when he's out, uh, Pakatan can get fifty two percent of the vote. His assessment is that if he were to go in, Pakatan get, can get sixty percent of the popular vote, and and so I think Najib will have uh, to do a lot, and he can't do he can't spend as much as he as he had, did before. Uh, 2013 uh, general elections, uh, because you know, that's why that's why we feel that uh, uh, it's it's going to be very bad for Najib to go uh, to the polls any time within the next one year, mm-hmm. because people will remember this, you know, and it's a it's a it's a grand injustice mm-hmm. to not just to Anwar but to you know 52 percent of Malaysians who voted for Pakatan. Let's talk about the younger generation today. They are no longer the 98 reformasi era generation. A lot of them have grown up and probably have kids and all that. But the younger generation today have probably um, more more um, idea about you know the strings of sedition acts. Uh, the sedition cases happen uh, nowadays rather than what happened in the 90s and all that. Um, so how how are you going to convince the younger generation um, from from the opposition side since uh, a lot of the younger generation today they are pretty either apathy or not having um, a partisan stance on uh, politics a Malaysian politics or a lot of them are even probably fed up the, of the whole you know uh, circus of Malaysian politics yeah definitely I think um uh, apathy and and uh, in fact, some people 
have anti-partisan feelings. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't like any parties. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the reality is that the nation needs to be governed and and the governance of a nation uh, under a parliamentary democracy demands that, um, you know, that you elect people who are able to contest in elections. And, and while we may have had, you know, independent candidates before, uh, by and large, to form a successful uh, uh, government with a comfortable majority, you do need to work within uh, both a coalition framework as well as a party framework. Uh, and, and like it or not, you know, if we ignore politics, if we ignore uh, uh, party politics, then it means that we don't care about how we're being taxed, it, we don't care about how public money is being used, we don't care about how our roads are being managed or mismanaged, um, and and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I think when for the young, the most important thing is the economy. And how is it that we are uh, using public money to spend for the you know for public good yeah i think younger generation today are craving for substance uh, either from the government or from the opposition uh, leadership uh, in the in the coming future uh, until the next general election will uh, economic or bread and butter issue be be the agenda that you will seriously look into and address yeah definitely i think um uh, uh, right now, under Pakatan Rakyat, uh, we administer three state governments, so Kelantan, Penang and uh, Selangor. And Selangor is the best case, I think, for a lot of young people, especially urban or semi-urban uh, young people. Uh, the administration of Selangor uh, will be, the, the, in a sense, the crown jewel of, uh, admi- of administering a state uh, using Pakatan Rakyat's uh, policies and, and, and formula. Uh, and the key to this is transparency, good governance, accountability, uh, and making sure that every every ringgit that's spent is spent you know in the most efficient way possible. So, for example, uh, the Menteri Besar uh, of Selangor, uh, Azmin Ali, uh, explained to the party the other day that uh, recently he uh, sent 25 um, state engineers to learn more about how to um, uh, lay better roads. For example, you know, and and because you know, Malaysia is a very wet country. You know, we we get you know a lot of rain. So when people uh, lay roads or when when they tar the roads, uh, tarring not in 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 a very uh, poor uh, way will you will have to tar more times. So for example, that that's what I mean when we say that you know when it comes to Pakatan Rakyat, it's about um, making sure you stretch that ringgit. And so you have 25 state engineers who will now know how to uh, lay better roads. So I think if we look at what Pakatan Raya is trying to do, um, then we see that at the end of the day, it is these are policies that benefit uh, uh, me as in as in like uh, individuals. Mm-hmm. And 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 so I think that is that is going to be the argument going mm-hmm. forward. And we we don't have we don't have control over the levers of of the economy. But we can make an argument at the mm-hmm. federal level, at the national level, that certain things need to be done. So, for example, Rafizi Ramli uh, has been uh, a vocal proponent of reducing uh, the oil prices. And if you remember... In, but in the oil early... prices has, has already been reduced. Yes. Uh, but... I mean, because of global market forces. Yes. No, no. But but initially, there was there was absolutely no... no uh, no inclination for the government to to reduce all prices. So if you look at the chronology, because people at Rafizi were were raising questions about how uh, the, the the mechanism of pricing for for petrol in in the country, um, therefore the government realised that people now know, and so they had to pull that back, uh, reduce the oil prices. And I I see it as that because if if Rafizi didn't pressure the government, you know they they wouldn't have done that. So I think. Eventually, they would have had to, um, but I think Rafizi sped that process up. Mm-hmm. And I think for a federal opposition, this is what you need to do. And people need to understand um, the different roles that uh, people play, mm-hmm. whether you're at a council level or, or state level or federal level. Mm-hmm. And when we understand, and then we can see how everything contributes back to the economy and comes back. To uh, you, I want, that's how it goes. I want to add more about Sabah and Sarawak. I think Sabah and Sarawak is one of the Achilles heels that 
you probably, I mean, uh, for the opposition side, would need to address. And with um, Anwar's, you know, being in prison, it probably will add more burden to uh, the opposition coalition. How are you going to address uh, the issues, which is totally different from Peninsula Malaysia, uh, within uh, the Sabah and Sarawakians area? Yeah, I think um, um, firstly, it's it's a very it's a definitely an uphill challenge uh, because a lot of our party leaders are barred from entering Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, in fact, a lot of NGO leaders as well, uh, you know, Dato Ambiga, Srinivasan, um, and and uh, you know Maria Chin, um, people. There are a lot of people who are just not allowed to enter Sabah and Sarawak, mm-hmm. and. Uh, but you see, in terms of uh, the work that's happening on the ground, uh, whether it's DAP's Impian Sarawak programs, or when when Pakatan is is trying to push for, you know, uh, or, or when when Kaadilan, for example, is is trying to push for um, our Sabah and Sarawak uh, wings, or, or rather uh, Sabah and Sarawak PKR, they are very very independent, and they are they realize that. Um, they have to they have to operate independently in that sense, you know, um, because first and foremost, a lot of the leaders can't go in, mm-hmm. so yeah. so so we can't we can't even get to the ground. So they have to really operate on their own, uh, and the work that a number of our MPs and so yeah, uh, empowering uh, local leaders there. We have to we mm. have to because uh, just practically we can't get in. Uh, you know, so we have uh, you know very very good MPs like Daryl Liking in Penampang or Si Chi Hao, yeah, in, 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 in Sarawak, mm-hmm. or Barubian in Bakalalan in, in Sarawak. So, uh, you, these are the leaders that have to step up and show how is it that Pakatan Rakyat and Keadilan in particular can benefit the local people, mm-hmm. you know, benefit uh, uh, Sabahans and Sarawakians. Mm-hmm. Actually, another, another major issue is that uh, there are a lot of Sabahans and Sarawakians who are working in Peninsula, uh, Peninsula Malaysia. So it's also about connecting with the Sabahans and the Sarawakians who are in Peninsula Malaysia. And so when they go back to vote, they also bring that message back. And I think that's very, very important because uh, by and large, I think there is a mindset, a, a mentality, a very poor uh, culture of looking at Sabahans and Sarawakians somehow as second-class citizens. And I think this is very, very unfortunate. Mm. Uh, I guess there's a lot of work to be done for the opposition leader as well. I mean, the opposition coalition as well as uh, the government side as well. But uh, let's talk about Anwar. Um, what What's your strategy next uh, uh, f- uh, post-Anwar so imprisonment? Are, yeah, there, there are a number of things that we will be focusing on. The first one will be a... Um, we will be filing a motion in Parliament to um, basically to to discuss and to um, debate about the the behavior of the judges during the course of the trial. Um, that's one. The second mm-hmm. one is the second one is uh, uh, what do you call this? The second one is we are going to um, conduct nightly vigils at uh, Penjara Sungai Buloh at the Sungai Buloh prison. Oh, that's where he will be placed. Yeah, that's where he is right now, mm-hmm. uh, and and we will be there. So we, we invite you know members of the public to come, uh, and then also today at eleven o'clock, um, uh, Nurul Nuha, his second daughter, mm-hmm. um, is going to launch a, an international campaign called March to Freedom, um, and that is going to be another aspect. So there's going to be um, certain actions that we will do within the country and certain actions that we will do out of the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, what about uh, in terms of uh, other aspect of your, uh, in terms of uh, either replacing Anwar leadership or are you going to restructure how how are you going to restructure yourself in terms of party Kadilan and so the and also the coalition. Uh, within within our um, constitution, uh, Kadilan, the 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 position of the Ketua Umum or the de facto leader does not need to be filled. Uh, and it's not something which is bound in that way. So structurally, we we still maintain. You know, the president is is uh, one Aziza, the deputy president is Azmin Ali, and then you have the vice president and so on and so forth. So that in that sense is uh, is not going to be affected. But in terms of uh, when you talk about say opposition leader or uh, how Pakatan Rakyat is going to function, 
for the opposition leader, we have yet to, it's a bit premature to, to question at this point in time because um, uh, what what we need to wait and hear from the uh, from the uh, election commission um, mm-hmm. that uh, that the seat of Pematan Pau has been vacated, but that hasn't happened yet. So I think we will cross that bridge when we get to it. Mm-hmm. So any final? But in terms of in, yeah, in terms of uh, the functioning of uh, Kaadilan, I think there are a lot of um, senior as well as younger leaders who are now stepping up, mm-hmm. and this is really an uh, an opportunity to showcase a lot of the young talent that we have. So I think mm-hmm. that's that's really good. That's that's uh, a big plus point. Mm-hmm. So all the best. But Thank any you. final message that you want to share with us uh, before we end the show? I think. Two things. The first one is we will never surrender, and the second one is we will never forget mm-hmm. what happened. And I think this is this is a big hit on on Malaysian democracy, and it is something that we must um, never forget, uh, especially going into the next general election. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, Fami Fazil. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.